All right, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kira, and I, along with my colleague Susan, um, have invited you all today to listen to Dr. Go talk about COVID. And I just have a couple of announcements before we um, turn the presentation over to her. Um, we have an upcoming good clinical practice training that SCCR is hosting on October 22nd from 9 to 1030 in the morning. And obviously it's through Zoom. And the title is Thinking Like a Monitor, Quality Management Practices for Your Day to Day. And this is being offered by one of our quality and compliance um, specialists in SCCR. Um, Susan just recently sent out the flyer and there's information about this course on our website as well where you can register. And then we also have a science series scheduled for December with Dr. Erica Sonnenberg on the importance of the of gut microbiome. So we'll be sending that flyer out towards um, probably later in the month or early November. So look out for that flyer and register for that upcoming training as well. And then I'll just take a minute to introduce our speaker. So Dr. Min, Min Jong Go is a clinical assistant professor um, at Stanford and she obtained her MD degree at the University of, of Illinois before completing residency in, in internal medicine at Stanford. She is currently working in the division of hospital medicine and serves as the section chief of uh, hospital medicine at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. She's also a sub-investigator um, working at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care on the uh, ACT-3 study, which is for the, tr the treatment of, um, of COVID-19. So we appreciate um, Dr. Go joining us today. Thanks for putting this presentation together. We hope that you guys find it useful. We are recording, so this will be available um, to you at the conclusion of today's class. And I will also be monitoring the chat. So if there's any questions that I can answer in the chat, I'll do my best. Otherwise, we will ask Dr. Go um, throughout the presentation. So with that, um, please go ahead and share your slides, Dr. Go, and start the presentation. Thank you. Let me see if I can share. Can you guys see my screen? Yep. Yes. Great. Okay. So I'm still adjusting to the Zoom. <laughs> um, so hi, everyone. I'm Min Jung Go. I'm a hospitalist at Stanford Healthcare Valley Care. Um, today, I'm here to share my perspective on the COVID. Um, I hope um, this lecture will be helpful to you. And uh, please uh, stop me at any time if you have any questions. And I probably won't be able to look at the chat, so I will probably rely on Kira or Susan to let me know if there is any question. So, um, so today I'd like to go over um, general epidemiology, so how the virus is being transmitted and how the distribution is happening worldwide. And also we're going to go over the prevalence and mortality and also talking about the diagnostic test, clinical symptoms, and clinical um, complications, and what treatments we have at this time based on the evidence, um, and also what researches are happening. And also, um, I want to spend a little bit of time um, looking at um, the COVID through the lens of the public health, so we'll uh, talk about the responses to the COVID pandemic. And just a little disclaimer before I start, um, all of this information about COVID is evolving, as you all know, and it's been updated and changing frequently. Um, I try to obtain as much of uh, most up-to-date information, but some of the slides may not reflect the most up-to-date information as things are evolving. So starting with the virology. Um, so what is COVID or coronavirus? Um, coronavirus is actually very well known and has been present for a long time and it's been present in both human and animals. Um, it is um, kind of mid-sized enveloped a positive strand RNA virus and it is um, a causing, uh, it's a type of virus that's causing one of the common virus a uh, cold. And, Particularly for the COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2, 
uh, also known as severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, is a type of coronavirus that's novel. It is under beta coronavirus, so it is related to um, SARS virus, which is a virus that was um, had an outbreak early in 2000s. Um, it shares about 70% of the gen um, uh, genome content, and also it is somewhat distantly related to MERS as well. Um, SARS-CoV-2 was first identified in December 2019 in Wuhan in China. And uh, at, at the moment, the current thought is it's probably bets are the primary source. So meaning it's a zoonotic disease that has been transmitted to the human. How it got transmitted is still not known at this time. It generally has about 14 days of the incubation, uh, meaning that people can um, start developing symptoms or can get sick anywhere between uh, 2 to 14 days after having an exposure. The median time based on current data is about four to five days. So meaning once someone gets exposed to the symptoms, uh, gets, I'm sorry, once someone gets exposed to the uh, COVID virus, um, the, it takes about four to five days on average to um, have a symptom onset. Um, and also another thing is that the, um, the transmission actually happens even before onset of symptoms. Um, and it is more contagious in the earlier stage of the illness. Uh, part of that is there's a high level of the virus uh, staying in the upper respiratory system in the beginning uh, phase of the illness. On the right, I share some of the pathways that's been studied so far. Um, so SARS-CoV-2 actually binds to the ACE2 receptor and um, gets replicated with the human body. And one thing I wanted to notice, depending on where the mechanisms are, um, the researchers are studying many different type of medications to block the pathways. So for the neutralizing antibodies, um, that's the convalescent plasma uh, studies. And also remdesivir is a nucleoside analog, which is um, uh, stopping the RNA replication. So how does it get transmitted? Um, there are a few thoughts about how these are transmitted. Uh, mostly it's through the direct contact, through the droplets. And there are indirect contact, meaning that someone touching the contaminated surfaces um, that has higher uh, amount of the virus and then touching their eyes, nose, or mouth where the mucous membrane is. And then also through the airborne, um, Vertical transmission is also possible, meaning that um, pregnant women, when they're delivering or even before the delivery, um, the fetus can get um, infected. However, it's very uncommon based on what we've known so far. And it, most of the neonatal inf uh, infection happens through the respiratory contact. And then the risk of transmission really depends on how the exposure happened, how long the exposure was, and what kind of preventative measures are um, done during at the time of contact. And um, studies been shown that the highest risk of transmission happens during the prolonged um, contact in the indoor setting. And part of the thought is it may be because of the uh, poor air circulation and the airborne um, uh, transmission route. Of these, the most common way of being transmitted is through direct contact, meaning that through the droplets. So just wanted to point out the quick differences of the droplet transmission versus airborne transmission. So the droplet transmission is when someone coughs or sneezes, um, there is a small droplet that um, goes through the saliva and mucus. And these droplets can get directly contacted to another individual. And these droplets are more than five micron, even though it's a very small in size, um, still it is big enough that it only can uh, travel up to six feet. And that's part of the reason why there is a recommendation to keep the social distancing. And for the airborne transmission, um, these are much tiny particles. So, um, so the droplets are usually five microns. It's much less in the airborne. So these small particles may stay in the air for a long time, uh, especially in the indoor setting. And this can happen while um, through the talking or singing, and it can potentially transmit the virus. 
but it's not very common. So how is this uh, distributed worldwide? Um, so now uh, it is a pandemic, meaning that it is uh, spread all across the world. Um, as you can see, um, there has been more than 36 million cases that's been confirmed as of October 7th of this year, since the onset. And there is a more than 1 million death uh, that happened so far. And as you, on the, here in this graph, it shows by the countries how um, high of those cases are happening by the country. So United States has the highest number of confirmed cases and also highest number of deaths um, in the world. And the, in average, um, the global mortality rate is about 2.9%. So I wanted to share the mortality in the most affected county, uh, countries. So looking at the observed um, case fatality ratio, meaning that the proportion of the deaths among the people who's confirmed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the global death to case ratio is about 2.9%, but that varies among the countries, uh, meaning um, that these are the top 20 countries that has been affected by the COVID, and um, by each country, they have a very different mortality rate. Um, Mexico being the highest mortality, U.S. is about 2.8%, and that is pretty similar to the average of the global death rate among the COVID patients. <clears throat> and in the United States, how it's being distributed. Um, so, sorry, give me one second. In the United States, um, there are about 7.5 million confirmed cases as of yesterday, and there are more than 200 deaths that happened. As you can see, these are the um, um, color-coded uh, maps where all, all the number of cases, the darker it is, the higher number of cases that happened in the last seven days. And um, on here, little column, it shows that uh, goes by the number of states. So Texas has the highest number of the COVID that have, uh, was diagnosed in the past seven days, followed by California and Wisconsin. Um, looking at the count, um, looking at the um, case ratio, as I mentioned, the California has the highest, followed by the Texas and Florida and Georgia. And then by looking at the top five counties, uh, Los Angeles County has the highest number of cases at, um, so far since the onset of the pandemic. So how's the mortality in the United States? Um, earlier I mentioned that globally, uh, U.S. has the highest number of deaths. But when you look at in terms of the total number of populations, it averages to the global level. So, so far, um, looking at the per 100,000 population, meaning that um, comparing the, uh, looking at the number of COVID deaths um, compared over the whole general population, including both confirmed cases and the healthy people, there's about 64 deaths per 100,000 population. And how does this compare to just in general mortality? Um, there are about 700 deaths expected per 100,000 population on average for all cause mortality in the states, according to 2018 data. So uh, we can say about 8% of the death at this moment is contributed to the COVID. And looking at the observed case um, fatality ratio, meaning that looking at number of deaths per 100 confirmed cases, it's about 2.8%. So it's, as, it's pretty as similar to where the global level is. Um, and looking at the uh, cities, um, New York had the highest number of deaths and followed by the Texas and California. And it's so hard to say why certain cities had the highest death red rates compared to the others. Um, there is some reports on the disparities in terms of health access, but that's still to be determined. Um, in, the, in terms of the prevalence in the United States, um, so, so far, um, it is shown to be about 8% overall positive rate, meaning of the number of tests that's been reported uh, since the onset of the pandemic, um, this is about 8% had turned into positive. 
And that, that rate has been slowly decreasing from the beginning. Um, more recently, um, that has been more remaining in the stable about 5.5% five to 4.8% 5 5 uh, range. Um, so meaning that people who get tested, um, it, about 4.8% 4, 4 are turning positive at this time. So who's at risk for the severe illness? Um, so many of the meta uh, analysis and research have shown that these are the type of the um, medical disease that has been associated with the severe disease. So people with the active cancer, more particularly the hematological malignancy like the leukemia or lung cancer or metastatic disease, there has been no clear association with the history of cancer, meaning people who's already in remission, not having active cancer, it's hard to say whether that's impacting or causing any severe illness um, in the COVID. And chronic kidney disease and COPD. So COPD is one of the chronic lung disease that has shown a strong association between the COVID and the severe illness um, with the COVID. Um, how, uh, for the other type of chronic lung disease, such as asthma, there is some mixed evidence related to that. And heart conditions such as heart failure, coronary artery disease, and cardiomyopathies. And immunocompromised state, meaning people who had a solid all, uh, organ transplant or someone who has HIV, or people who are on an immunomodulator therapy, they tend to have um, those um, medical conditions are associated with the severe illness and obesity and sickle cell and smoking and type 2 diabetes. How does it get diagnosed? So um, in terms of looking at the test, there are two ways to look at the test um, methods. One is diagnostic test. So this is the molecular test or antigen test. So this is to check for active infection. These two types of tests will not show whether someone had a prior exposure or had an immune system developed. This is purely to test whether someone has actual active, active disease. And it is done through either nasal pharyngeal swab, so meaning someone put a little swab through the nose to um, get some of the samples or through the saliva. Um, it's more common to have a nasal pharyngeal swab. There's a still in the works um, to develop saliva-based test. And for the molecular test, um, there is a PCR and lymph test that's done. These are very more, these are probably most sensitive, most specific tests. The downside of that is it takes some longer time to get the results. So depending on where the test is done, where it's being sent, and uh, where it gets done, uh, based on the location, it may take a few days to a week. Um, and for the antigen test, this is a rapid diagnostic test. Um, it is not as sensitive or specific compared to the molecular test, but it is really fast. So people who come into the emergency room uh, who have a severe symptoms, um, you know, people usually use a rapid diagnostic test to determine where the patient can um, be um, triaged to. Um, so certain, um, and there are many different companies who's making this rapid diagnostic test. And, the uh, sensitivity really varies. So sometimes, um, even if patient tests negative, um, it may have to send to the molecular testing um, if the clinical suspicion is high. Antibody testing is basically looking at the blood samples to see if there's any immunity. So looking at IgG and IgM level to determine the uh, recent or uh, past infection. As to how to interpret that number is still in discussion, and um, that is to uh, that is to be determined based on the future studies. So, who is recommended to getting test? Um, currently, the guideline varies based on the uh, state and local agencies, and that is depending on the test availabilities and uh, the prevalence of the disease. Um, Currently, the CDC guidelines shows that people who have symptoms, who had a close contact, meaning that people who spend more than 15 minutes within the six feet of the infected person, um, and people who's been referred by the healthcare providers, those are the people who need to be, who are recommended to be tested. And for this subset of, and this uh, recommendation is different people compared to the people who just need to go out, get tested for their curiosity or to 
participate in the public surveillance. Um, these people are the people who potentially could have disease. So it is strongly recommended that people to self-quarantine or isolate themselves until the test results come back. And how are the clinical symptoms presenting in COVID? It is really wide range. Um, some people are asymptomatic, some are mild, and some are very critical. And in the most common symptoms are listed on the left. Um, so cough, fever, short of breath, fatigue, uh, myalgia, so muscle ache or body aches and headaches, loss of taste or smell, sore throat, congestion or runny nose, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, um, and sometimes chest pain. Um, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of petho, um, pathophysiology, the COVID, SARS-CoV-2 actually enters the system human cells um, through the ACE2 receptor. Um, so meaning many of the organs that has been impacted are where the ACE2 receptors are abundant. So lung is one of the most affected organs. Um, so that's, and these are presented as a cough, fever, or short of breath. And on the right, I just put a little slide of um, um, graph of what are the common symptoms among a different situation. So Looking at the non-hospitalized young people, their common symptoms are cough and sore, um, sore throat, and also um, some abdominal pain, which is a little bit higher compared to the adult setting. So of the adult, uh, adult population, the people who's been non-hospitalized, so meaning having more mild disease, they tend to complain more of the cough and also myalgia, and then also headache, compared to the hospitalized patient. The hospitalized patient, more common symptoms are cough and shortness of breath, um, are, and also fevers are the more, most common symptoms of the people who have a severe disease. I'll pause here, do any questions? And in terms of um, the clinical course, um, so in China, there has been a court study that's been reported uh, who um, that looked at more than 44,000 people who have been infected. When they looked at this population, about 81% of the people would have a mild to moderate disease. So having mild symptoms of like cough, short of breath, or abdominal pain, or some mild pneumonia. And about 14% of the population have a severe disease, meaning requiring um, 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 oxygen or have a severe lung involvement. And 5% of the people have a critical um, illness. And then, one, sorry to interrupt, this is okay. Kira. There is one question from Donna. Um, she okay. asked, with regard to COVID long haulers, have they correlated with high viral load? So um, just to clarify, the COVID long haulers, meaning that people who have a long disease, like uh, po turning positive for a long time. I just wanted to clarify the COVID long hauler, what, the def what, what, they, what, it, uh, what that means. If I had to guess, I would say that's probably what Donna means. Okay. The, the, okay. the ones that, have, that take a while. Yeah, she said lingering symptoms, one that take the gotcha. patients that, ha that take yep. longer to recover. Yeah, no, great, great question. So um, people um, with the severe disease, usually the recovery time is about two, uh, it could be anywhere from three to six weeks. But in during this time, people turn to positive when they do the testing, meaning that they still notice that um, the virus being present. As to whether those are the infectious virus is not really um, been answered, meaning that um, you know, even though people being tested still positive after many weeks of being contracted the disease, um, studies have been shown that those are not infectious type of virus. It's just a, many of the dead virus that's just still been uh, present. And because of the testing is very sensitive, those are picking up those uh, uh, dead viruses or not infected virus. Did that answer your question? Okay. 
So, uh, all right. So, um, in terms of um, the COVID nineteen hospitalization, it is also has been associated with age. Um, so, compared to the young population, um, as people um, get older, meaning people in the 50 is over above, have a much higher um, chance or incidence of having being hospitalized and higher um, uh, prevent, higher risk of having um, poor outcome. Part of this is that people with um, a, a older age group tend to have many of the comorbidities that's associated with the severe illness. In terms of the clinical courses, um, also there are a few notable laboratory findings. Um, so based on the uh, what's been studied so far, people with the COVID tend to have a lymphopenia, meaning that low number of lymphocytes are noted on the blood count, and then neutrophilia, and thrombocytopenia, so less number of the platelet counts. Also noted to have elevated liver enzyme functions, um, LDH, and CRP and ferritin and D-dimer. These are all inflammatory markers. In a way, um, the, what this is suggesting is that um, the people who contracted COVID tend to go through a significant inflammatory process within the body. And these are um, also on the right, um, these are the type of lab tests that's associated with a strong, a severe COVID infection. How, um, however, this does not sh has there has been no association in terms of prognosis, um, meaning that these if people for those who have a high number of D-dimer CRP or LDH, they tend to have a severe disease, but it doesn't nece does not necessarily um, is correlated to the prognosis in the world. Another clinical course findings is the imaging findings. Um, so when we looked at the uh, pe um, people with the COVID disease with the chest X-ray or chest CT, there has been a um, few th abnormal things found. The common things are ground glass opacity plus minus some consolidations. And these abnormalities are often noted in the bilateral, so both side, on the side, and then lower lung zone distribution. And these are not specific findings, um, meaning that um, you know many of other disease can also present similarly, on, can be noted on similarly on the imaging findings. But um, these are what's been commonly found on the people with the COVID disease. Another thing that's been noted is that these many of these lung findings tend to last very long, even after recovery. So there still is uh, some people who studying. Um, the long-term residual Im impact on these uh, lung findings, even after recovery on the, among COVID patients. And in terms of the complications, um, we've noted a few things in the patient with the COVID. So the most common thing is acute respiratory failure. So about um, 12 to 24 percent of the hospitalized patient required mechanical ventilation. Um, meaning that uh, people cannot breathe their own um, to require uh, and cannot oxygenate enough that they require mechanical ventilation. And also acute kidney injuries and liver dysfunction and also septic shock um, from the virus itself, but also coming from the secondary infections such as a bacterial infection or fungal disease and cardiac complications, including arrhythmias, abnormal rhythms, um, heart attack and also cardiomyopathy, meaning enlarge of the heart. And also another very notable thing is a thrombotic complication, meaning that blood clots can form in this, um, there has been a um, lot, um, many people with the COVID disease um, have a blood clots to be formed within the body, especially the pulmonary embolism, clot, blood clot in the lung, or acute stroke, and sometimes arterial thrombosis, meaning the blood clot in the artery that blocks the blood flow to the arms or other body parts. Um, so as part of, um, and it's still under investigation why this is happening and what the prevalence is. Um, as 
because we have noticed a hyperbolic complications among COVID patients within the hospital setting, um, it is recommended that we do um, uh, anticoagulation prophylaxis to prevent these clots. Um, in terms of the recovery, um, so, um, it norm so as I mentioned earlier, um, for it really, the recovery time is variable depending on um, age uh, and other comorbidities. So people with the mild infection, it takes about two weeks um, to recover, and it takes about three to six weeks for the severe disease. Um, even after recovery, meaning no symptoms, no people, um, no fevers, um, people still have longer symptoms such as fatigue is one of the most complained symptoms after the recovery, um, even after test being tested negative. And in terms of the immunity, um, studies have been shown that um, you know, people do develop both humoral immunity and cell-mediated immunity, meaning that they're uh, building immediate immune reaction and also long-term reaction. However, it is still not known if all infected patients are developing protective immune response and how long it will last. Um, these are being studied through a lot of biobanking and public uh, surveillance um, to see how the, each people's immunities are responding. So hopefully those results will be available in the near future. And in general, um, short-term reinfection risk appears to be low. As to long-term squalor, um, there has been some discussion about this uh, COVID infection can um, result in um, permanent damage in the lung or fibrosis and some neurological um, um, damages. However, these are still under investigation and it's still not known at this time. So in terms of the treatment, how do we treat people with the COVID? Um, the way I um, divided it is people with the mild symptoms and people with the moderate to severe symptoms. So patients with the mild symptoms are usually staying home, not requiring oxygen, but requires isolation so that it, um, the disease can be contained within themselves, not spreading to others. Um, and also re recommended to have a symptom monitoring um, the reason is because there is always a chance that the symptoms can progress, especially for the uh, low oxygen level, which can require hospitalization. So some patients who come into the emergency room or in the, off, um, um, the, um, in the emergency room, they are sent home with the oxygen monitoring. Um, so that way they can be monitored at home. And if they have worsening symptoms, symptoms, they could come back to the hospital. And usually it's just a, a supportive care, meaning hydration, Tylenol, or other medications to help with the fevers and general body aches. Uh, patient with the moderate to severe symptoms, um, many people, these people are the ones that who require oxygenation or additional supporting. Um, uh, treatment. Um, these people require hospitalization and of those people, the medications that we are currently using based on the evidence um, is remdesivir, dexamethasone, and convalescent plasma, um, prone position, and DVT prophylaxis, meaning the anticoagulation prophylaxis to prevent uh, thrombosis, and oxygen supportive care. And sometimes in the very severe setting, uh, people may need ECMO or mechanical ventilation. Um, in regards to the convalescent plasma, um, it's still controversial in terms of efficacy. Um, when I talk about the research and what studies have been done on this medication, I'll go over those. And just a, one thing about the prone position, I just thought this is something interesting to share. So what prone position is that basically people are being on the face down, like in the sleep position, uh, while they're awake. And the reason um, this is recommended that some studies show that there has disimproved the oxygenation within the lung uh, because the COVID tends to cause a mismatch in, the, in, the, in between the ventilations. Um, and um, this tends to delay or decrease the um, uh, decrease um, the chance of requiring mechanical ventilation. So 
Um, while a patient is in the hospital, um, many of the institutions are recommending people to do, uh, stay in prone position when they're awake. Um, so what kind of personal protective equipment are um, used in the healthcare setting? Um, I think this is really depending on we, how, what supplies are available. And um, so uh, because the COVID is um, considered as both a droplet and airborne, it is recommended to use N95 and the face shields and a gloves and the uh, isolation gown. Um, initially, and still now, there is a, a global shortage of the N95 mask. So alternative that CDC is recommending is um, using just a regular face mask as opposed to N95 if it's not available. And um, there are many um, studies and uh, investigation that's being done how or whether we can recycle and reuse um, and disinfect used N95 so that we can continue to provide the supplies for the healthcare workers. So I'll pause there. Any questions? All right. So in terms of research, um, I'm really glad to see that there is a, a good vision and plan about how the COVID research is done, um, especially in the United States. So I think in the um, clinical setting, there are four areas where that's being uh, focused. One is trying to improve the knowledge of the COVID. So looking at the, uh, collecting the blood specimens and doing public, public health surveillance as the, um, studies to see how the disease are spread and also at the cellular level how the transmission is done and also developing the diagnostic assays. Um, you know we do have a di diagnostic test but it is um, still takes time so you know trying to develop some and it's costly so trying to figure out a more sustainable more affordable um, testing method would be really helpful to um, control the pandemic. And in terms of a treatment, there are many trials that's happening um, globally and, um, and within the states. Um, I wanted to talk about a few trials that has resulted in emergency use uh, for certain medications such as remdesivir, dexamethasone, and convalescent plasma. Um, and also in terms of the prevention, there are many vaccine trials that's being planned and is happening at this time. Within the Stanford level, um, when I looked at um, the Stanford Vice website, um, it was divided into the four themes about rapid discovery, human resilience, and um, recovery and post-pandemic cooperation. So looking at very comprehensive research, and I was very excited to see that there are more than 400 registered researches that's been happening within the Stanford campus. So current research in terms of the treatment. So um, adaptive COVID-19 treatment trial called ACT. And um, so it is sponsored by NIAID, NIH. So this is multi-center adaptive, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Um, this is basically to evaluate the um, safety and the efficacy of many therapeutic um, agents in the hospitalized adult. Um, so just, just kind of breaking down this uh, statement of multi-adaptive randomized double-blind. So basically patients and the investigator will not know what kind of agents are being um, given to the patient and all the data are collected and statistically analyzed to see if there is any effect, um, if these therapeutics are beneficial um, to treat the COVID. And it is adaptive trial, meaning that each arms are comparing different medications and based on those the results, the next arms are being determined to um, study for a different therapeutic agent. Um, so, so far, currently we're on the ACT-3. Um, ACT-1 was done using a remdesivir versus placebo. This happened uh, from the beginning of the March through May. And the study actually showed that there is a remdesivir had a faster recovery time. So it decreased by four days in terms of the symptom 
a resolution of the symptoms. There was a no statistical significance in terms of mortality benefits. So how does this translate into the actual clinical practice? You know, four days of the improvement is, it means a lot in the healthcare system. Imagine one of the reason there, um, that the lockdown happened is to prevent healthcare system breakdowns, meaning that we wanted to prevent a huge influx of the sick people coming into the hospital by decreasing the number of the COVID happening in the community level. And by decreasing the symptom, the people can get out of the ICU faster. Uh, people can get discharged faster from the hospital. And these are helping um, to preserve the hospital system level. And people have a, are, people are suffering less through all this um, traumatic experience in a way to go over this severe illness. The second arm was for the remdesivir. At, I'm sorry, um, through the ACT-1, the remdesivir showed the benefit um, in terms of the recovery. And through this um, trial, uh, remdesivir was approved by the FDA for the emergency use and has become part of the standard, standard of care. And on the ACT-2, the remdesivir is, um, has become a backbone. And then the next comparison medication was the barcinib, uh, which is a JAK2 inhibitor. Enrollment was completed at the end of August, and the, currently the results are pending at this time. Um, there is some um, announcement that forcidinib has shown some benefits in the mild to moderate disease patient. So hopefully the publication will come out soon. Currently, the ACT3, we are comparing the remdesivir plus the interferon beta versus placebo. This is a sub-Q injection, and the enrollment is in progress at this time. Any questions about the ACT trial? Okay. So I'll move on to the next um, important the trial, which is the recovery trial. So this is a randomized controlled open label. So meaning that, you know, subject who's receiving the medication and um, investigator who's giving the medication knew what medications are given to the patients. And it's also adaptive trial that's been happening in the United Kingdom. Um, one of the notable thing is that they have a really large population enrollment all across from the UK. So this brings a really good power to the study. And they've actually looked at many different treatment arms. So just the regular typical step supportive care. And they looked at antiviral therapy, which is stopped because it was not effective and dexamethasone. They've actually stopped the enrollment for most of the population. They're only enrolling the children at this time. And hydroxychloroquine, and these are also stopped because there is no efficacy or clinical benefits. And azithromycin and tocilizumab and convalescent plasma. And another arm that's recently been added is the Regeneron COVID-2, which is a type of monoclonal antibody. Um, just back in um, July, August time, um, there was a breakthrough about the looking at the dexamethasone arm. So people who've received a 60 milligrams of dexamethasone, either by mouth or IV for a total 10 days, there has been a reduced mortality benefit. Um, so this actually has um, been announced and has result um, has um, moved on to as a standard of therapy in among many institutions. And looking at, uh, but what, there are still um, controversial discussions. Um, the reason is because it only helped with a subset of population. So meaning that dexamethasone helped in the reduced um, mortality in the patients who's requiring um, oxygen or requiring mechanical ventilation, so someone who's more moderate or severe disease. It actually didn't do good, didn't do any good for people who's requiring no oxygen. Um, however, the impact of this study is that dexamethasone is very cheap and it is widely available. Um, meaning that, and also it's, it can be given by the pills, meaning that, you know, for moderate disease who 
may not require hospital stay, but you know, can get the oxygens at home. These are the medications can be given in the outpatient setting as well. So that's why this is a breakthrough um, research. Uh, but I think there's still more result need to be come out to be discussed about true the efficacy of it. And another um, concern of that was the open label study, meaning this was not double blinded. So that gives some limitations to study uh, because um, the concern is that potentially it could have influenced um, how um, things are being observed uh, because people knew what um, each subjects were getting. Any questions on the recovery trial? So next one is the um, convalescent plasma trial. Um, so most recently, and the largest um, program was Mayo Expanded Access Program. So convalescent plasma is uh, basically taking the pool of a blood product, the plasma, from people who recover the disease and trying to use this neutralizing antibody and give it to the um, people who have active infection. The concept of the convalescent plasma has been um, present for a long time, and it's being studied on the COVID. So for uh, one of the largest observation study was the Mayo Expanded Access Program. So many um, centers were uh, participated in this program, program. Um, and it was open label, and more than 77,000 patients with the severe or life-threatening uh, COVID received uh, convalescent plasma through the, um, the expanded access program. Uh, it is no longer available since FDA issued uh, EUA use on, uh, in August. So meaning that now people can get through the EUA program. Um, this actually resulted quite controversial uh, conversation. Um, official statement coming from the NIH treatment guideline panel is that it shows insufficient data. The reason being is that this was open label study. There has been no randomized control study to uh, see the true efficacy of it. There is not enough data to support or against of this treatment. At this point, the current um, uh, recommendation is it should not be considered as a standard of care at this time, um, and it will re require more trials at this time. So um, very exciting that there are more trials that's on the way. Um, so there are two subset um, that's being investigated on. One is the hospitalized patient um, randomized trial. So passive immunity trial, this has been, I believe it's been um, led by the Vanderbilt and then contain COVID is led by the NYU. So these are the two upcoming trials um, to um, study the efficacy of the convalescent plasma. One area that's been studied right now is the outpatient trial. So patient with the mild symptoms, but has high um, profiles of potentially leading into the severe um, disease. Um, those people will be receiving the plasma, a convalescent plasma at the early phase and see if that will uh, prevent the progression. And this is our patient study that's been led by the Stanford and I'm very exciting and I'm curious to see how this result will, uh, what result will show. Any questions on the convalescent plasma? All right. So other additional trials that's been done and we're waiting for some results is the tocilizumab. Um, another pathway, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, COVID, um, SARS-CoV-2 impacts, uh, creates a lot of cytokine storms and IL-6 is one of the, um, you know, uh, one of the cytokine markers that's been noted in the patient with the COVID. So some observation studies show that there is a mortality benefit. There was a recently industry-sponsored industry uh, trial that happened. Um, Stanford was one of the site as well. Um, um, there will be more data to be available on this randomized trial. Um, the thought is maybe it is showing mortality benefits on certain type of subset of the patients. Another 
um, study that I wanted to point out is the post prophylaxis exposure. So there was a lot of um, hype about hydroxychloroquine earlier in the phase, uh, earlier uh, part of the pandemic. And there was a, a randomized study that was done um, uh, to look at the efficacy of the hydroxychloroquine as a prophylaxis. Um, so meaning they studied on the patient. These medications were given within a few days after the confirmed exposure and follow to see if this prevent any uh, further infection, uh, developing an infection. It actually, there was no um, benefit as a post prophylaxis exposure. So um, at this point, hydroxychloroquine is not recommended. It has too much of side effects and it's not helping either as a treatment nor as a post prophylaxis exposure at this time. So I'll stop here and ask to see if um, if anyone has any questions. All right. So I'll move on to um, the more of um, COVID pandemic through the lens of public health. Um, I think this is very unique. Um, you know, I think the last time when the global pandemic happened was the Spanish flu about 100 years ago. Um, this is just kind of, um, you know, capturing the key events that happened in the early phase of pandemic. So in December in China, there was a cluster of the cases that happened within um, China. And at the time, people were concerned that this may be a novel um, disease. However, there was a lot of um, sort of opportunities, um, this could have been, uh, this information could have been relayed, but there was some delay. Um, and in January, um, WHO announced that there has, um, there is a infection that's happening as a COVID-19. COVID and within few weeks, two months, it has been, has become endemic. So meaning that spread all over the continent, so closer to China. And then within a month term, it has become a pandemic and has been impacted on many, many countries and resulted in a lot of fatalities and uh, impacted on um, the economical and healthcare system. So how did the WHO responded to the COVID pandemic? Initially, um, as soon as they announced it, they looked and they um, opened up the strategy, they developed the strategies to look at more um, at a global level, trying to engage many countries in um, all the sectors in the communities, try to identify and increase the testing levels um, availabilities and try to control the cases and uh, quickly providing the guidelines about the travel restrictions and social distancing. And how did the CDC respond to the COVID pandemic? And I think this slide captures a good um, sort of things that the CDC has done. Um, within the United States, they um, provided the guidances about the travel restrictions, trying to develop and create the system to expand um, diagnostic capabilities and also providing guidances on the healthcare system level about how to prepare for it. And also developing um, guidances in terms at a non-hospital setting to minimize the spread of the disease and sharing the information to the community and local health department and public agencies. Additionally, it is um, also, CDC is also trying to um, put um, a lot of help through other countries through the emergency responses and collaboration with other countries at this time. And there are many areas that could have been improved, but I think within the circumstances, um, these things are done to help to build the structures uh, within the United States. And 
how was the COVID uh, response done at a more locally and different sect sector of the healthcare system? So healthcare providers and researchers um, are providing a lot of patient care and education and COVID and research and vaccine development, as I mentioned earlier. And public health departments and healthcare agencies are collecting um, surveillance data and doing a lot of data analysis and doing contact tracing and trying to develop the guidelines and communications are uh, trying to provide the communications to the public. Um, there are many challenges that's happening at this time from the beginning. Dealing with unknown is always a scary and has been created a lot of fears, not only among the population to the pub at the public level, but also among the healthcare providers, uh, frontline um, staff, um, EMT, nurses, doctors, and also working with the limited resources, both within the healthcare setting and the public uh, health system, um, that has been a lot of struggle. Um, just to give you an example about working with the limited resources, um, you know, you've probably seen this picture of the nurses using garbage bags at one of the New York hospital. Um, and, you know, this was the first time when CDC actually uh, come up with the guidelines about how to reuse or do an extended use of the personal protective equipment. Um, because there is a shortage of the public uh, protect, personal protective equipment. And also, um, because of the long um, um, course of this COVID pandemic, it has created a lot of physical and mental exhaustions about uh, among the healthcare workforce. Um, many of the health officials in the public health sector are either fired or quitting because of the stresses and a lot of um, uh, you know, challenges to implement the policies that's happening. Um, Public health um, leaders are healthcare trained and they require um, extra level and subset of experiences. So when the office um, leaders are frequently changing, as you can imagine, there could be a lot of um, challenges and chaos that can happen um, to find a someone who can take over those places and try to, um, you know, kind of uh, work on the, the policies with the, um, you know, limited uh, staff. And at a healthcare system, it is causing a lot of emotional stresses. Um, um, and a lot of, there's a lot of data is showing that many healthcare providers are actually experiencing PTSD through the COVID pandemic. And it also resulted a lot of disparities. Um, it actually brought up a lot of disparities that happened within the um, United States. Okay, I think I see one chat here. I'm not sure. Is there a question? Oh, sorry. Uh, Debbie just said, this has okay. been a good summary. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, so um, this is a, a CDC slide looking at the social vulnerability index. So what social vulnerability index is a way to identify communities that need support before, during, and after public health emergencies. So basically people who have lack of resources, um, lack of um, higher incidence of like lack of housing, um, uh, lack of um, in a public health support system. And, and as you can see on the blue, these are the darker areas where there is a high vulnerability. What's interesting is that this actually matches with the incidence of the COVID cases in the United States. What this graph tells me is that a lot of, um, you know, COVID is impacting people who's more vulnerable and needs more help. And this actually is more notable when we look at in terms of the racial and ethnic minority groups. Um, this is the data that was published in um, September 15th. 
The green shows the percentage of total population in the United States and percent cases. So when you look at the green bar, um, that's the total population in the United States. As you can see in the white non-Hispanic population, the percent cases are um, less. Um, but looking at the percentage of the Hispanic population in the U.S., there is a lot higher number of cases among those population and the black. Um, so this is quite concerning and there is a lot of um, discussions of as to why this is happening. A uh, few things are uh, the social vulnerability, meaning that um, you know, many of the Hispanic and Black um, communities have lack of resources and higher incidence of the um, higher rates of um, lower income, lower um, the housing issues, and those are the, the concerns that may be showing, um, um, that may increase um, the incidences of the COVID-19. And this also impacts on the hospitalization and death um, by looking at the race and ethnicity. So compared to the non white non-Hispanic people, um, in the American Indians, Alaskan Natives are five times likely to be hospitalized, 1.45 times likely to have death from the COVID, and the Black populations are the same so as the Hispanic. Um, and additionally, it's not just the COVID. Um, these um, Black Native American Hispanics have elevated levels of um, impact on the mental health as well. They have a higher reported suicide, suicide, suicide ideation, depressed symptoms, and the fear of COVID. And they're more likely to be isolated and lose that con um, close uh, contact in the support. And there is higher incidence of um, food insecurity. So how is CDC trying to respond to this health uh, disparity? Um, they have, they're they trying to involve more of the community level and trying to engage um, more diverse leaders, trying to identify these disparities, um, more evidence-based approach and more data-driven approach. So it would be um, interesting to see how this will be um, carried out in the future. The goal is to have the same opportunities and um, access to the healthcare system. And how has COVID also impacted on other parts of the healthcare system? Interestingly, with the scare of the COVID, there has been a lot of delay in the non-communicable disease, meaning that um, when the COVID hit, um, a lot of elective cases had to be stopped. Um, part of the reason is because to preserve healthcare system overload. And also, um, there was a lot of uh, personal protective equipment shortage. So you have to figure out which areas are the ones that had that can be weighted. So many of the elective procedures and cases were um, halted or paused um, in the beginning of the um, pandemic. And also with a lot of scare of the COVID, many people actually decided not to come into the hospital. So as you look at it, um, you know, people who have all the, the less number of people actually came to the hospital, even with the symptoms, they delay on seeking for immediate care, even if they have a concerning symptoms uh, for non-COVID related issues. Um, so, Globally, um, and this was not just only um, the United States, you know, for many re uh, reasons like uh, limited resources and lack of healthcare system to cover for non-COVID related disease. Worldwide, there has been a lot of delays in the non-communicable disease care. Um, according to WHO, um, it is based, um, there's a concern that, you know, basically we're maybe stepping backwards on dealing with a lot of eliminating preventable children disease 
and death um, because um, many of the resources are had to be dedicated to COVID pandemic. And it also impacted a lot financially. Um, as I mentioned, many of the hospital had to stop many of the elective cases and had to invest a lot of money to be prepared for the COVID um, related health uh, care. Um, a lot of hospital had to create extra flow pools to uh, support the, prov uh, the care patient need to increase the capacity, had to bring many extra equipment, had to secure a lot of um, healthcare supplies, including uh, mechanical ventilator, which are very expensive. While, um, you know, the hospital don't know how many patients will be coming into the hospital, uh, how, and yet they had to be prepared. Um, and also a lot of financial losses happen because um, other cares were not provided. Many of the elective cases had to be uh, paused during this uh, pandemic preparedness. Through this process, um, you know, many of the healthcare system had to be restructured, um, had to be reorganized. Some had to be closed down. Um, and some, some institutions actually had to let go of their employees. And um, it will be kind of interesting to see what the long-term consequences of this is. On the other note, there is also positive impact in the healthcare system. Telemedicine was present for some time in the uh, healthcare system, but through the COVID, um, there has been significant increase in the telemedicine utilization. Um, this is the recent Medicare data. Um, the blue is showing up, um, is showing how much of telemedicine um, usage since the pandemic. So previous to COVID, almost none, and many of the cares were done through the telemedicine, meaning that this is probably a pathway that can be explored in the future to increase the healthcare access to a lot of people who need it, especially in the area where there's not enough of the care, uh, the med healthcare providers. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where this goes in the future. So I'll stop here um, and open to the, uh, to the, uh, to, the uh, to the participants if um, there's any questions. Um, this is my um, end of the presentation, but I want to um, um, wanted to have more open discussion after this. And I'll stop my screen, sharing my screen. Thank you, Minjong. Um, if, uh, I think people should be able to unmute. Um, if not, please type any questions in the Q&A and um, Dr. Go will, will be happy to answer those. So their hand and we will unmute them for them. So if they wanna speak, uh, please, uh, um, I, I believe there is a feature by your name that you could raise your hand. I can also, I can also yeah. just um, uh, voice. We can there. allow them to so Donna, Donna also yeah. asked, how did the decrease in ER visits impact the overall COVID mortality? Um, that's a great question. I don't think I have an actual uh, number of data, but I can share my experiences. Um, so I don't think um, people stop coming to the emergency. So people who have a COVID symptoms, actually most people come to the hospital and to the emergency room. So I don't think it impacted overall COVID mortality. Um, but because many of the patients and populations are so worried about the COVID or contracting COVID in the emergency room, many people stop coming to the emergency room for the other non-COVID related illness. Um, just personally speaking, there, um, so, you know, in the media, in the media, when initially onset of the COVID pandemic, there was, um, you know, a lot of scary pictures of the, how the ER and the healthcare system was saturated with the COVID patients, um, especially in the New York uh, hospital setting. So, um, that created a lot of scare. So many people who have stroke symptoms or heart attack, um, or other like hyper, uh, high glucose, um, they just stopped coming to the hospital. Initially, um, you know, many of these problems happens 
all the time. But we've noticed a sudden drop of people coming with the stroke symptoms or chest pains. So it will be, I don't think there's any data at this time, but it will be interesting to see um, whether there was how much of um, those impacted happened on non-COVID mortality. Yeah, CNN did have a, um, yeah. a, a presented on that, specifically yeah. cardiovascular um, issues. Right. They were seeing a large yeah. decrease in yeah. people um, being scared to come to the hospital with um, stroke yeah. or heart attack symptoms. Right. No, I mean, just and I mean, just from my personal experience, uh, people who really need to come into hospital, they're just getting a, they're just trying to get a call through the telemedicine way for days to see the doctors, and you know, from the tele, the limitation of the telemedicine is that people can only provide certain advices and be able to triage. So, like you know, people ended up coming to the hospital, they ended up having longer hospital stay um, because they came in a much sicker state um, with. So um, it results in much, much more intense care and longer hospital stays on these patients. Okay. Another question about how, did, how do you respond to people that think COVID is fake and or a political tactic? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all that's the, a, share all the data with them. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> data. That's, yeah, that, that's a great result. And it's far more deadly than the flu. <laughs> No, that is a great question, and I think that's a, a huge struggle. And, you know, this fake news and inaccurate data um, is a really concerning. Um, you know, from the healthcare perspective, a lot of people are trying as much as we can, trying to do as much as we can to spread the accurate information by providing lectures to at many occasions and you know, writing a lot of opinion columns. Um, many of our hospitalists, one of the example is Dr. Tom Sloof within my um, group. He is putting um, his opinion to and um, in the U.S. today routinely to express our facts and um, to comment on these inaccurate information and fake news that's happening. Yeah, and then even the new, um, you know, the recent yeah. op-ed piece in the New England Journal of Medicine, which has yeah. never been done right from this journal. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not tap, you know, not supporting another candidate, but saying, you know, this administration has done a really poor job with managing this pandemic. And that actually has, so you know, these inaccurate information, and that's one of the role. Um, and this is my personal opinion. Um, you know, while I was giving the presentation, I was trying to focus on the uh, facts. Um, my personal opinion: this is that you know, public. Um, public health and healthcare agency needs to focus on how to message um, these um, facts correctly and um, in a, um, in not in a scary level. So I think that how to message is really important. And I really hope that many of the leaders will um, carry on the messages consistently that has been recommended by the science and researchers. Um, Good question from um, Shivali. Um, what are the, she said, sorry if I missed this, but what are the best performing treatments for COVID at the moment based on trials? Um, yep. Time on clinical trials for vaccines are being shortened. Is this concerning for the safety profile? Great. So great question. So the, currently the evidence um, shows that the most effective treatment to decrease the symptom is the remdesivir. And that's part of the reason why it has become a standard of care and it has been authorized to use as an emergency use um, through the FDA. And also the second standard of care at this moment is the dexamethasone um, that was found based on the recovery. The limitations of these medications, especially for the remdesivir is the IV remdesivir, meaning that people in the outpatient setting will not be able to get this. So there are more researches happening through the Gilead looking at the inhaled remdesivir and also looking at uh, possibly giving like uh, limited doses in the outpatient setting of the remdesivir. So those are being studied um, in the inpatient setting remdesivir and dexamethasone. And um, dexamethasone is a little bit, um, you know, still controversial because it was open labeled. Um, because it was a very large study, there is enough power to show. It is still being recommended because it is cheap. It is widely available. Um, you know, many of the countries where there is um, scared resources, I think this would be a good medications to use and when there is a, a no benefit. Um, are there some other 
um, data that's been shown through the phase three clinical trial is the tocilizumab. Um, I think the publication will come out hopefully soon, and still the randomized trial result needs to become out um, to come out. And then the convalescent plasma, there definitely has been a benefit. Um, it's just that it's not been uh, random. It's it's not been studied through the randomized randomized clinical trial and double-blinded. So that's um, the part where it needs to be proven to show more definite evidence um, for the benefit. Did that yeah. answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, another question about um, tri trials, uh, vaccine trials, are we getting close to knowing um, about safety and efficacy around vaccines? Um, I'm not an expert in the vaccine, but based on what I know, um, I think it's still going to take some time. Like safety and efficacy, there are, um, I believe there are, so, um, you know, WHO keeps all the list of the profiles of potential vaccines that's uh, being studied um, all across the world. Um, many of, some of them are at the phase three trials, but, you know, in order to um, create a vaccine, so vaccine is to have a prevent. The purpose of vaccine is for prevention. So we need to make sure that there is a high standard of the safety. Um, and also um, making sure that the side effects is been well studied. So to do so, it requires a long time to enroll the right people and to make sure to look at the data carefully. You know, in the research setting, um, I think COVID is probably one of the only topic that has um, established such a short time research and putting out the research data um, because there is a, a strong need for treatment and the prevention. Um, I think especially for the prevention because the risk of having um, unsafe vaccine is really, really high that it will require more time to be studied. Uh <laughs> Maybe a controversial question politically: Is the is United States president contagious <laughs> at this moment? Um, people think that he probably he is still contagious, depending on when his last negative, uh, you know, COVID test was, or when his first positive COVID test was. We don't actually know that. They, the White House has been unwilling to share that information. Right. So, um, so we don't know. <laughs> is my yeah, is my answer to that right? I don't think I would know the answer to this um, because just like uh, um, here you mentioned, like there's no, uh, we don't know when no, the last not. negative or last positive. We have so many unknowns. Um, just in the population setting, um, people um, tend to become non-infectious within 10 days of the onset of the symptoms. Um, that's for people with the mild to moderate disease. So people with a more severe disease, um, sometimes they can, and especially for some people who's in an immunocompromised state, um, the um, infectiousness can happen as long as like 20 days. So that's where the isolation guideline is hap um, based on. So, um, you know, depending on the severity of disease, it can be short or long. Um, I do want to go back on the earlier question about like when to stop um, just kind of taking a look on the previous question about when to stop the isolation. So in terms of the isolation, the current recommendation is based on the symptoms. Um, uh, initially, initial recommendation is to do the repeat testing to make sure that people are negative. Actually, that's no longer recommended. Only on the, um, you know, uh, cases, only on rare uh, few cases. The reason is because that, um, even people who's completely recovered from the symptom perspective, people still turn positive, and the, and those um, positive vi those viruses that's been picked up from those patients are uh, considered to be non-infectious. So um, that's why the current recommendation is based on the symptom rather than the actual testing. And we've seen some people who turn negative and turn positive again, and. Mm -hmm. It's just because uh, the PCR test is very sensitive and also how the test is done, uh, meaning that, you know, depending on how people swap it, that can also impact some of the results of the test. And just two more questions so far. Um, who is covering the cost for all the free COVID tests? How does this affect the future of the healthcare system? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> 
So I think the cost is being shared many different levels. Um, I think there's a federal and state. Um, so, you know, this free COVID testing is, um, you know, depending on where the test is done and where the test is set up, um, you know, for the public health surveillance, meaning looking at the community um, setting, you know, those are um, sponsored by the government and, um, you know, state level. And also there are some researchers um, and uh, foundations who are supporting for these costs. Um, you know, one of the recent, one of the study that's been happening within the Stanford campus is the TREC study, which is looking at the populations of the um, uh, surveillance of the COVID rates um, in the in the Bay Area population, and that's been sponsored by uh, Zuckerberg Foundation. So you know many of those tests were uh, funded through that research program. Um, you know people who's um, going through the healthcare setting, meaning going coming into the emergency room or coming into the hospital to get tested, those are um, probably being covered by the insurance payers uh, of the patients. And then, um, can you be infected more than once? My understanding is that yes, because the immunogenicity of, you know, your immune response to this uh, yes. virus is not great. Um, and so people, it has been shown yep. that people can be reinfected more than once. Yeah, uh, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah that, that's a great question. I think um, the answer is still unknown. Um, the immediate reinfection risk is very low but there has been cases where people do get reinfected. Um, in the research community, the things are being um, looked into is that there's some concern that the immune, immunity that people are building up after the infection is relatively short rather than long. Um, the other thing um, is that, you know, there could potentially could be a lot of mutations that happens throughout the, um, you know, because it's the nature of the virus. So, you know, will that cause more severe symptoms? Um, that's another question. And will that cause a different type of infection? Yeah. And then Monique asks, are you aware of any research on increased use of telemedicine in the inpatient environment due to COVID? Um, I'm not aware of any research as far as I know. Um, I think at least within the Stanford system, I don't know if there's any studies that's being studied for that. Um, I think yeah. still this, go ahead. Sorry. I was just gonna say, Monique, the only thing that I you know, yep. um, I know about is just um, not from a research perspective, but consent is being done you know, via Zoom for many of the research participants who are COVID positive just from an infection control you know, precaution. Obviously that's not a research study, um, but I mean, if, if patients are inpatient, they're obviously sick and need to be inpatient, um, and they're receiving that care and, and, and seeing their providers, um, you know, in the hospital. So I don't, I'm not also aware of any research that's, that's going on from a telemedicine perspective for inpatient. Certainly without patients, um, telemedicine has skyrocketed over the last, um, you know, six to eight months, which is fantastic and probably, um, will lead to greater use of telemedicine in the future, even when a pandemic is not what we're worrying about. Um, let's see. I think we have a couple more questions um, and a couple more minutes. So uh, Donna, <laughs> Donna, I'm sorry to hear this. Um, Donna said her college age daughter just had COVID. She quarantined for 10 days per her Department of Health uh, guidelines. And Donna's wondering if she could still be infectious. Um, so, so it's been 10 days since the onset of symptoms. Um, you, know, um, you know, at individual level, it's hard to say, um, but generally speaking, many of the studies so far has been shown that after 10 days of this onset of symptoms, especially for the patient who had a mild and moderate disease, um, um, it is less likely to be infectious. Um, so that's why people, uh, many of the local agencies and the healthcare system are saying 10 days of the isolation uh, from the onset of symptoms. If there's any concern, I would still wear a mask because, I mean, it, regardless of the concerns, I say um, wearing a mask um, as a universal precaution is very helpful. And one thing I just wanted to point out, the reason that um, 
you know, public health leaders and many of the researchers are recommending masking is to prevent the spread of the disease. When people looked at the, um, so when, so the re, so wearing mask is not to protect ourselves, it's to protect others. So meaning that when infected individual is wearing a mask, the chance of the droplet spreading to um, the next person uh, substantially decreases and the chance of the, uh, the, uh, the virus become aerosolizing decreases substantially. So that's the reason for the universal masking and keeping that social distancing. And then one, uh, we'll end with one more question from David. Um, what unanswered medical question would you like, would you most like to have answered to help you care for COVID patients? In, oh, that's a very great question. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I wanted to end with this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I think medical, it's long-term squalor is probably one. Um, how our current treatment, so our current treatment is focusing on the treating current infection. And I think that's something that, um, you know, we need to um, study more. And also the other area is the uh, subset of population that we haven't really focused a lot on. One is the pregnant woman and children. Um, you know, I think one thing I didn't mention in detail is the uh, multi-system inflammation in children after the COVID disease. Um, children tend to have less uh, severe symptoms. It's very rare that they have a severe symptoms, but after recovery or in the process of recovery, they go through very severe inflammatory system. Um, most people do, most children do recover, but I think that's the area that we are so uh, don't have the answer. And I think that's something to study more to for the risk stratification purposes. Well, thank you for the conducting the Q&A. A lot of good questions. Thanks for everybody's participation in that. Um, I do want to respect our speaker's time as well as everybody else's time, so we will end here. But Dr. Go, thank you so much for this presentation and for everybody who participated and joined today. Um, really helpful information. Um, and thanks again for all the questions. And we hope to see you guys soon um, in December on the science series lecture on gut microbiome. Um, otherwise, before for our next GCP um, training on thinking like a monitor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful. Appreciate it.